With the primary election one week away, the Democratic nomination for governor seems to be Martha Coakley's to lose. For months, polls have showed the sitting attorney general leading treasurer Steve Grossman and health care executive Don Berwick by a comfortable margin. But as Coakley tries to close the deal, some say her campaign stops feel understated, even a bit anxious. And as WGBH News reporter Adam Riley explains, Coakley's bruising 2010 loss to Scott Brown could be a big reason why. According to the polls, Martha Coakley is the overwhelming favorite to win the Democratic nomination for governor next Tuesday. But as Coakley tries to close the deal, her mood is hardly triumphal. Mr. Lord Mayor, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Welcome to West Rock. Thank you very much. Personality is one factor. Coakley, the state's attorney general, has the button-down demeanor of a career prosecutor. And soaring oratory has never been her stock in trade. If we invest in our people, we invest in our kids, we invest in health care and mental health care, we can turn this economy around for everybody. We can make Massachusetts prosperous and fair. But if Coakley's campaign seems a bit muted, there's another reason. Well, with all due respect, it's not the Kennedy seat, and it's not the Democrat seat, it's okay. the people's seat. Four years on, Coakley's loss to Scott Brown in the race for Ted Kennedy's old Senate seat still casts a shadow. It's become a case study in what happens when a frontrunner gets complacent. At the Democratic convention in June, Coakley tried to put that defeat behind her. I understand how much of your heart and soul was in that race. Mine too. Coakley says she's moved on and that voters are moving on too. When I first ran, I knew that would be an issue. I knew that I would have to win every vote. I've said there'll be no hand on shook in Massachusetts. I've done that work, and I believe that people see that. And as I've gotten asked about it through January, February, March, I get asked about it less and less. But according to UMass Boston political scientist Aaron O'Brien, that doesn't mean Coakley has been forgiven. The unwillingness right now to coalesce around her, to say, we're going to give you our, our money, we're going to do the GOTV, we're going to do those things, speaks to the fact that the guys at the table, and it is guys in the Democratic Party in Massachusetts, haven't embraced her. O'Brien says Democratic insiders worry that Coakley can't beat likely Republican nominee Charlie Baker in November, and that anxiety is taking a toll. Now we've seen the polls close between her and Baker, and I think Democrats are at fault there by not rallying around a candidate that has maintained a double-digit lead without the Democrats' support all summer. Now we see that, that lack of support in the sort of Baker's numbers going up. That's good news for Coakley's Democratic rivals. For them, Coakley's 2010 collapse is a reason for hope and an argument to vote for them next Tuesday. Look, the fact of the matter is Martha Coakley was ahead of Scott Brown by 15 points with 13 days left, and she lost by five points, a 20-point swing in a 13-day period. So this race is up for grabs. Um, what would make you more electable than Martha Coakley in November? Well, the Democrats that I'm meeting in the uh, primary race are very, very worried about new losing another big election. Um, and uh, we, 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 we've got that, that specter hovering over us. But the Martha Coakley who's running for governor today may not be the same candidate who lost four years ago. Last week, after Coakley was endorsed by several black ministers, the Reverend Jeffrey Brown praised her for turning defeat into an asset. In the Senate race, uh, the circumstances were we didn't hear from her until, you know, towards the end of the race. She came out early looking for us, talking with us, asking for advice, meeting with us, and showed a real hunger, in my opinion. Uh, more than the hunger you saw last time around? More than the hunger that I saw last time around. Still, if that extra intensity helps Coakley land the nomination, she'll have to clear one more hurdle before she can put the past to rest. The state GOP actually just released a new web spot arguing basically that uh, for Martha Coakley, 2014 is sort of a replay of 2010. Mm. There's some big differences that we should all keep in mind as we talk about this. Most notably, I think, is that Scott Brown rode that huge wave of early Tea Party enthusiasm to victory. That's not something where there's a parallel in this race. But if she's the nominee, we are going to hear this refrain again and again and again. But I mean, Adam, as, as you know, a lot of candidates have lost 
big races. Scott Brown among them lost to Elizabeth Warren. Charlie Baker, Baker, right? To, to, Steve Grossman. Why was is Martha Coakley the one who's so much on the defensive to the point where she felt it necessary to apologize to her own party? I think in part because losing that Kennedy seat, even though it didn't belong to the Kennedy family, <laughs> yeah, hurt so yeah. much for Democrats. Yeah. I think um, that's probably one reason that there's still that lingering mm. resentment and, and disappointment. And I think also it's possible, this is a point that Aaron O'Brien made when we interviewed her, that Coakley is held to something of a different standard because she's a woman. Bingo. All right. <laughs> That's the answer we were looking for. All right. Here joining me now is, is uh, uh, Shannon O'Brien, former, uh, former gubernatorial candidate and, and uh, who's actively supporting Martha Coakley, I should say. Welcome to Greater Boston, Shannon. So is, is this fair? I mean, we're, we're picking on Martha Coakley a little bit and comparing her to her last run. We're not doing that with other candidates. I think that she is actually running a pretty good campaign. And when you think about the fact that 2010 aside, she has weathered a million dollars worth of negative advertising from the Grossman PAC as well as the Republican Governors Association, and she's still ahead of her Democratic opponents, and she's still in a dead heat with Charlie Baker, who is running his campaign, I think doing a better job than he did the last time, but there's no negative advertising being run against Charlie Baker. He's, he's really running scot-free right now. The fact that she's doing as well as she is right now, getting beat up so much, I, I actually think it's a, it's a pretty positive yeah, thing as, for her. As you know, the Boston Globe uh, endorsed uh, Steve Grossman last week. Even today, when she was on Boston Public Radio, there was a little bit of equivocating. She, she speaks in, in prosecutorial terms. Um, we will look at that. We will weigh those. We will, we will measure that. So it's always, rather than saying, bing, bang, that, I, I believe in this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. It's like, it, it's very measured. I don't think there are four fabulous orators running for governor right now. I mean, I think you have three Democrats and a Republican who are all good, competent candidates who all have very important things to say. That being said, they're not Deval Patrick. They're not mm -hmm. Barack Obama. I mean, maybe we have a, a different standard right now that we're looking for. So, so I think that it's a little bit unfair because maybe, maybe we've been uh, a sort of, uh, I don't know, treated to the fact that Deval Patrick, some people like him, don't like him. I think he's, you know, done a good job. But the most important thing that I think he has done is set a bar in terms of oratory, in terms of getting people to think about big themes uh, as a candidate. And sometimes I think that especially the press gets a little bit disappointed when their oratory isn't soaring. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to bring another voice into this. We're going to bring Joan Vanaki. She's a keen political observer, columnist for the Boston Globe. So we're talking about, you know, Martha Coakley's persona or one thing, but she's also being judged on some of her decisions. For instance, the partners mergers, the hospitals merger. And she's taken a beating for that, even though she's very definitive about that. She backs her decision all the way. She's still been under the gun slightly or in the background, her prosecution of uh, one-time treasurer Tim Cahill. She's kind of judged by her past in, in ways that other candidates are not? Well, she has a record. And I mean, I don't think her problem is 2010. I think her problem is 2014. Um, I agree with what you said about oratory. There aren't any great speech givers in this race. And when it, if it is Coakley versus Baker, it'll be kind of a draw. But she should be judged by her record as an attorney general. Um, she's run, I think, a kind of safe and cautious front runners campaign. She talked about that convention of saying mm -hmm. her heart and soul was in that race for Senate. There isn't quite that sense of passion this time around. I mean, maybe in the last week we'll see some of it. I mean, nobody likes to lose. But she really hasn't made the case, I don't think, as to why does she want to be governor. She needs to sell that, that piece of it, and I don't think she has yet. Do you, Shannon? Has she? I, th I, think, that, I think that there are a lot of people right now who like the storyline that she has this ghost of 2010. I mean, the fact is, she has spoken extremely passionately about the issue of mental health. You know, she had a brother who, who uh, you know, uh, had mental health mm. issues. It's something that I think she's very yeah. passionate about. And also, I'm probably one of those people who's been in a room where she's actually funny and relaxed. And I can tell you, as someone who's been there, sometimes the person you see in person is not always the person mm. you see on camera. So I do think I agree with John. She's going to have to do a better job of connecting one-on-one -on -one with people. Uh, but, but also Ultimately, you know, you're going to have a close race. You have three strong Democratic candidates who are running right now, and you have the front runner who went from a 20, 30 point uh, lead to only a 12 or 20 point lead. Uh, but the fact is, the next week it's really going to be about the ground game. Can you get your people to the polls? And I think if she can do that, I think she's going to maintain that front runner status and but, probably win. But, you know, 
John, the media won't let this go, this, <laughs> this 2010th. And I mean, even today, uh, we have a little clip from uh, Boston Public Radio. It's like it comes up constantly. Here's what she said today. I've acknowledged that we made mistakes, and frankly, uh, I think that it has helped me be a better candidate this time around, understanding that people want to see you, they want to hear you. I understand uh, that people feel they didn't get that in a very short special election, and they were disappointed by the loss. I don't think it's terrible that she's asked that question. I think that was a good answer. And again, when it's head-to-head -head with Baker, yes, the media's fallen in love with the 2010 narrative. But as you mentioned in the precede, or someone said, um, you know, Baker lost, too. Yeah. So I think the same question can be put mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. um, th and it does, will be. Right. And I also think a tougher <laughs> question for Charlie Baker going into the election, you know, going back to the future, we're going back to the future 2010 for, for Martha Coakley. If they go back to the weld days, I mean, those are a lot of the ads that are being run mm -hmm. right now by the Republican Governors Association. I think it's very, very difficult because you're going to be going back to the big dig. You're going to be going back to, you know, some of the scandals they had right. at the Treasury and the lottery. I, wanna, I don't know if they want to go wanna jump on looking too far in the past. Taking off yeah. his tie isn't going to be enough in the general election. He has to answer some tough questions yeah. about his own record and his part of that in that administration. You know, when you m mentioned, um, you know, the angle being being a woman is tougher and it's hard sometimes one on one. Carrie Healy had the same image of one on one. She was terrific. She could be fun, you know, you know, take her hair down. Are we just generally tougher on the female candidates, and are they more cautious because of that? I don't think it's sexism. I really don't. Look I didn't at say sexism. Oh, right. I said well, tougher. Tougher. I don't know. <laughs> Look at Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. Um, I guess Hard maybe to get at her. Some people would say that she had some, you know, tough media criticism. She kept the media at arm's length. She did, but she's also she she just has a, a way of directly getting her message out, and some of that is a gift. It's like a Deval Patrick mm -hmm. gift to be able to engage mm -hmm. people that way. And not everybody can be Elizabeth Warren. Not everybody can be Deval Patrick. But luckily for Martha Coakley, she'll be running against Charlie Baker. Mm -hmm. I mean, That's he's true. no Elizabeth Warren either. <laughs> or Steve Grossman. All right, always fun to have you here, Shannon O'Brien, Joan Vanaki. Thanks Thank so much.